Welcome to Esquire Group's video on what is the best jurisdiction for my trust or foundation. My name is Jimmy Sexton, LLM. I am the founder and CEO of Esquire Group. One question that I'm always asked when doing wealth planning with clients is, what is the best jurisdiction for me to set up my trust or foundation in? And I wish there was a best jurisdiction that I could just tell you, this is where you need to do it, because that would make my job much easier. But the correct answer is, it depends. Depends on your unique situation. There are a lot of factors to consider, and that's what we're gonna talk about in this video. But before we do, a little disclaimer. This presentation is prepared for educational purposes only. This presentation is not legal or tax advice, nor is it to be construed as such. Each individual circumstances are different. You should seek legal and or tax advice to address any specific questions you may have. So I put together a list of things that I think are important to consider when setting up a trust or foundation and, and choosing the jurisdiction for that trust or foundation. And we're gonna go through all of these in a little bit of detail. So first, you need to consider you and your beneficiaries' citizenship and residencies. You need to consider your estate planning and succession planning goals, as well as your tax goals, your wealth protection goals, privacy goals. What type of management are you gonna have in this structure? Is it gonna be self-managed by you and your family or advisors, or is it gonna be professionally managed by a professional trustee, for example? Uh, what are your banking needs? What type of regulation is the structure going to be subject to? What kind of legal system does the jurisdiction have? What's the reputational impact of the jurisdiction? What's the cost of the jurisdiction? And the geographical location. Now, in order to try to keep this video a relatively reasonable length, I try to keep my videos between 10 and 15 minutes, I've combined some of these issues into one slide or some of these considerations into one slide. Let's get into it. So first, citizenship and residencies. How will your country of citizen or citizenship or residency treat the structure? Will they even recognize the structure? So for example, trusts generally are not recognized in civil law jurisdictions, meaning even if you set up a trust and transfer assets to it, it's very likely that a civil law jurisdiction is still gonna treat you as the owner of those assets which is probably not what you want in order to accomplish your various goals. And many common law countries have a hard time grappling with foundations because they don't have this concept. Like in the United States, for example, the tax code does not have any provisions for how statutory foundations should be treated. They're treated as either trusts or companies but how they're treated is up to the tax professional to, to determine it depends on various factors. So you need to consider how is, how do your citizenships and residencies impact the, the structure? Another example is if you're a US citizen and you form a foreign trust or foreign foundation, you're still gonna be considered the owner of, of those assets that you place in the trust or foundation for income tax purposes, even though you don't own them. So, how is your countries of citizenship and residency going to impact the structure? Will t transferring assets to the structure have tax consequences? A lot of times it will. I mean, a lot of times if you live in a country with a developed tax system and you're transferring appreciated assets into a trust or a foundation, that could result in a gain recognition event on transferring those assets in. So that's, of course, something that needs to be thought about. Will there be attribution of the structure assets to the settler founder? So it's kind of like what I mentioned with the US, right? Even though those assets have been transferred to a trust or foundation, the US is gonna attribute ownership of those assets to the person that transferred them and they're still gonna be responsible for paying income taxes on the income generated by those assets. Some other countries, for example, follow that same logic and they treat the person that transferred the assets into the structure as, as continuing to, to own those assets, which has tax implications. And finally, how will distributions be taxed given your citizenship and residency? Some countries don't tax distributions, some countries do. Some don't tax distributions of corpus, but they tax distributions of income. So again, this needs to be looked at. 
What are your estate and succession planning goals? So how long do you want this structure to exist? Is it supposed to be multi-generational? Do you want it to exist in perpetuity? So s some countries have limits, like let's say 125 years in Malta, for example, it's the longest a, tr a trust can exist. Well, a foundation can exist in perpetuity. S some jurisdictions it's a thousand years. Some there's absolutely no limit, but that's something that needs to be looked at depending on what your ultimate goals are for the longevity of this structure. Are there any limits on who can be a beneficiary? I'm going to go back to Malta as an example. Malta has a rule that if you're setting up a family trust, uh, family is only up to the fifth collateral line of relatives. After that, they don't qualify to be part of a family trust anymore. Are there any restrictions on who can be a beneficiary, right? Like some jurisdictions, I'm going to use Malta again, with a family trust, they only allow natural persons to be beneficiaries. So you can't have an entity be a beneficiary or a charity, for example, which is, is fairly restrictive, but it is what it is. My point is it needs to be looked at. Are there any restrictions on the distribution provision? So for example, are there going to be any restrictions on the types of um, distributions that can be made, on when they're made, on who they're made to? Again, something to be reviewed. Are there any restrictions on how the structure can be managed? Some Jurisdictions, for example, require professional management and not every client wants professional management. They want to manage it themselves or uh, in conjunction with their family or trusted advisors. So again, something to consider. Are there any special rules concerning protectors or guardians? Are they allowed? Are they required? Uh, what powers are they allowed to have? Are there any restrictions on their powers? In, in some instances, like here in the UAE, if you have a purpose foundation, for example, a guardian is required. So again, all things to consider. What are the tax implications in that jurisdiction, right? First, does the jurisdiction where you're setting up this trust or foundation have taxes? If so, which taxes are gonna to apply to the structure and how's the structure gonna be taxed? What are the tax compliance requirements? Do you have to file a tax return? Do you have to pay quarterly taxes? What needs to be done in order to comply with the tax laws in that country? Does the jurisdiction have tax treaties? And if so, what are the requirements for having the trust or foundation be able to use those tax treaties and benefit from them? Because a lot of times it's not as simple as setting up an entity and just using their tax treaties due to anti-treaty shopping provisions. And if the structure is being self-managed, does the self-management of the structure have any implications on the structure due to the citizenship and residencies of the people managing the structure? In the case of a private trust company, for example, if that private trust company is owned and managed in a jurisdiction outside where the trust is, that could have tax implications for not only the private trust company, but the people who own it, because it may be considered in the US, for example, it would probably be considered a controlled foreign corporation. So you, you need to look at the management, right? And the other thing is, another example is you could have a structure where the counselors or the, those acting as the board of directors of that structure live in Germany and they're managing a structure from the UAE. Well, Germany would likely say, hey, the central control and management of this company is taking place, of this trust or, or foundation is taking place in Germany, therefore it's liable for tax in Germany. So again, it's something you have to pay a lot of attention to because the citizenship and residency of the management team and those who owned the management company, if there was a management company, all play a big role in how the structure is gonna be taxed. What are your wealth protection goals? How are the jurisdictions wealth protection laws and do the courts generally uphold those laws or do they generally side with the claimant? If you look at the US, for example, a lot of US jurisdictions, especially with trusts, they side with the claimant and the asset protection rules don't provide as much benefit as you, as you would hope they do because the courts in a lot of times, except for maybe Wyoming, try to side with the claimant. What is the statute of limitations for transferring assets to the structure? A lot of times if you transfer assets to a structure, there's a window in which if, if you get sued, 
those assets can be clawed back out of the structure. So you want as short of a statute of limitations period as possible. So you need to look at what the statute of limitations period is on the transfer of assets to the structure. And are there any firewall legislations, right? So for example, a lot of uh, typical jurisdictions that you would use for trusts and foundations have laws that don't recognize foreign judgments. That's some firewall legislation. There's other types. Again, what sort of firewall legislation exists that's going to benefit the, the structure. What type of privacy are you looking for, right? A lot of countries, jurisdictions now have beneficial owner registers, okay? So now you're in a beneficial owner register. Is it a private register where it can only be accessed by governments or is it a public register where anybody can search it? You don't get much privacy if it's a public register then anybody can search it. And does the beneficial owner register apply differently to trusts and foundations? In some jurisdictions, the beneficial owner register does not apply to trusts. Some of them, there's a completely separate beneficial owner register for trusts. Is there a trust or foundation registry? So for example, is there a list of all the trusts or foundations in that country? And does it apply differently? In some jurisdictions, for example, Foundations are entered into the corporate registry and there is a list of all of them, but trusts are private documents that aren't listed anywhere. Other jurisdictions, trusts have to be registered and there is a list of which trusts exist in the jurisdiction. Are there any automatic exchange of information provisions within that jurisdiction, like the Common Reporting Standard or, or, or DAC 6, which requires the reporting of aggressive tax planning? How do you want the structure to be managed? is professional management required, right? This is a deal breaker for a lot of people. A lot of people don't want professional management. They want a private trust company or they want to uh, privately manage their foundation with a combination of themselves together with family members and trusted advisors and stuff like that. They don't want a professional trust company or professional directors running their structure. And if that's the case, then a jurisdiction that requires professional management is not really going to be an option. And if you are going to use professional management, how well, how are those professionals regulated in that jurisdiction? How well are they regulated? Are they reliable professionals in, in, in that jurisdiction? And are there any special requirements connected to managing the structure? Some structures, for example, even if it's privately managed, require those managing it to get some regulator approval. Is an administrator required? A lot of countries, while they don't require a professional management team, do require a local administrator to keep the books and ensure that the structure complies with local law. Well, personally, I feel that this is a big benefit to the structure to make sure it has proper corporate governance and everything is done properly. It does add to the cost and some people don't want that. As everybody knows, banking has become a huge issue. Getting bank accounts is a monumental pain in the ass. And so are there going to be any issues getting a bank account for this structure, right? I mean, some jurisdictions are viewed as, as risky and banks don't want to open accounts for them. So that is a very big consideration that if you're going to start a structure, are you going to be able to get a bank account for it? And a lot of times, if it's especially if it's a jurisdiction that is maybe questionable, you're only going to be able to use local banks. And if you're only going to be able to use local banks, how reputable are those banks? How reliable and stable are they? Are? So the banking is something very important that needs to be considered. What regulations are going to apply to the structure? You know, a lot of jurisdictions now have economic substance regulations that require the core income generating activities and the management of the structure to take place within the country where it's established. Um, you know, what are the beneficial owner register rules are going to apply? What sort of annual filing requirements are there going to be? And, and are those acceptable to you? Like I had mentioned in the previous slide, if the structure is going to be self-managed, like with you and your family trusted advisors, are those managing the structure going to need to seek regulatory approval for themselves in order to be able to self-manage the structure? What type of legal system does the country have? Is it civil law? Is it common law? And depending on which, how does that interact with your home jurisdiction's legal system? Because a lot of times there's issues if you have a structure in a civil law jurisdiction, but you live in a common law jurisdiction or vice versa, 
because they're kind of incompatible legal systems. And how well does the legal system work? Is it reliable? How well do the courts function? Are, are they unbiased? Do, do they make fair judgments? Maybe look at how the courts have ruled in the past with regard to these structures and see if it's acceptable to you. Are the courts reliable? Are they efficient? Or is it going to take 10 years to resolve a matter, which you know nobody really wants? What is the reputational impact of the structure? And again, this has a lot to do with the banking. Like, are they on a blacklist? Is it a sanctioned country, right? Because this is going to have a huge impact not only on banking, but on who you can do business with and, and, and how deeply your structure is going to be scrutinized when you when you do try to engage in business with it. And those are those are things that, that need to be looked at because negative reputation is negative for the structure. Uh, what is the cost, right? Um, the better the jurisdiction, normally the more it's going to cost. But cost is a huge factor, uh, not just in the setup cost, but what is the realistic running cost? Because the realistic running costs are almost always more than advertised. And so you really need to look at what the all-in annual costs are of managing this, this structure. Uh, and finally, we're going to get into the geographic location. How does the geographic location of the structure impact it? Uh, one of the big things that you need to consider, like I mentioned before, there's now these economic substance regulations which require the structure to be managed in the jurisdiction where it's set up. So if it's being self-managed, this is going to require the board meetings to take place in that jurisdiction as well as any you know, management and control of the structure which may require people to travel to that jurisdiction. Is it a realistic place for people to travel to? How difficult is it to get to? How good is the infrastructure, right? So, because if it's not realistic that those who are managing the structure are gonna be able to travel there as often as needed in order to carry out their duties, then that structure's, that jurisdiction is gonna be a no-go. And how well does the geographic location of the structure fit optically with your life and your assets, right? I mean, I don't particularly like it when you have somebody in the, in the United States or in Europe whose life and business is centered around there and then they have a trust like in, let's say, New Zealand. New Zealand might be a great place to have trust, but it's on the other side of the world, right? Like if any regulator or tax authority or anybody were to look at that, they'd go, why the hell does this guy have a trust in New Zealand. There's got to be something up here, right? And then they start trying to prove that even though you did nothing wrong, right? So you want to make sure that the jurisdiction you choose optically fits with your life and your businesses. Pro tip, it's generally better to pay up for a more reputable jurisdiction. Like with anything, quality costs more and the same goes for jurisdictions. So I think in the long run, it's always better to pay up for a, a better jurisdiction. If you have any questions about selecting a jurisdiction, please feel free to contact us. You can reach out to us at EsquireGroup.com or shoot us an email at info at EsquireGroup.com. I hope you found this information useful. See you on a later Esquire Group video. Bye.